This is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. Each year, the National Awards for Education Reporting recognize the best of the best. The winner of the Heckinger Grand Prize this time around went to a collaboration between the Virginia Center for Investigative Reporting and ProPublica's local reporting network. The project, Uprooted, showed how systemic racism enabled the eradication of a Black-owned neighborhood in order to make way for university in Newport News, Virginia. Joining us now to represent the winning reporting team is Brandy Kellum. She conceived the project and spent more than two years bringing it to fruition. Brandy, welcome to EWA Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. We're delighted to have you. For our listeners who may not have yet read your stories or seen the accompanying documentary, could you give us a quick synopsis of the background story? Maybe we start with who were Barbara and James Johnson? Yes, absolutely. So James and Barbara Johnson are an 80-year-old couple who currently live in Newport News, Virginia. They're pretty much the center point of our story because they have family ties to this property and this land that we're discussing and we examined in our story that goes back to almost 100 years. So the backstory on this family is James's grandfather came into Newport News with this property in the early 1900s. It soon became a community. He purchased about 30 acres of 100 acres of a community. It soon grew into a very stronghold black community in the midst of what was becoming a middle class white suburbia in Newport News at the time. And up until 1960, the community had been able to remain there and uh, primarily black families had pass land down to their children. And in 1961, the city decided to pretty much gut the core of the community, seize 60 acres from many of these families who had been there for generations and displace them all across the city. So James and Barbara Johnson are still living in their house. They're one of five houses that remain in that community and they're just holding on for as long as they can. And they've been living there ever since they got married in the 1960s. So You know, they were a great family to sort of center the story on, especially since James, unbeknownst to, I I think a lot of people in the area had all this documentation that prove what the community used to be and essentially what happened to the community over the last 60 or some odd years. I want to talk about how this happened and then also why it happened. But first of all, the mechanism by which they seize this land is a process called eminent domain. It's every state uses some version of it, and it doesn't take much for the government to claim that seizing private land is for the public good. And that's what happened here, right? Absolutely. So in this case, the government claimed that seizing this land from these black families was in the public good because they wanted to place a university in the middle of that community. And so there was a lot of controversy because of that. Obviously, the black residents felt like there was more sinister reasons for their community being targeted. And what our reporting did find was even though eminent domain is a public policy that is used by the federal government and local governments to take areas that have maybe been delayed or blighted was a key word used back then and sort of reinvest in those areas and redevelop them. During this time period in our country, eminent domain and urban renewal was also a code for black removal. And a lot of black communities were targeted for these projects, right? And in this case, this community was a middle-class up and coming community of doctors dentist. There was a NASA engineer who worked on the Apollo, you know, high school principals, a very much middle class black community was being established here. And they were building their homes with whatever means they could. And these were nice looking homes for that time period. So the blighted designation to this community really didn't hold water for these black residents. And they did feel like their community was amongst the many in this country that were being targeted at the time to just displace black families so that areas that weren't really interested, so to speak, in integrating at the time could keep that level of segregation and separation between white and black. What I thought the project really captured beautifully and and tragically is the generational impact here, because it was extraordinarily difficult then, as it often is still now, for Black families, Black individuals to become homeowners. Banks were reluctant to lend to them. And as you said, they often left these houses to their children. So by eradicating that neighborhood, it meant that 
the next generation was less likely to become homeowners, to enjoy that kind of social mobility and wealth and opportunity and get to send their children maybe to higher education, which is what this university moving in was promising. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you raised that point because generationally, these families had to find other means and places to live. One of the things we did note in our reporting is that many of these families were underpaid for their homes when they were requested or required to leave and go somewhere else. So if you talk about generational wealth, the net aspect, they're not even getting the same value that they would have put into building the home to go find a home someplace else. And that was one of the main arguments that they made, that not only aren't there many places for us as Black families to live in the city, but now we're also getting less than what our property is worth. So how can you expect us to find this same type of means somewhere else? You were surprised by the amount of documentation that William Johnson had at his home. I mean, I love those moments, don't you? When when sources <laughs> yes. say, you know, I probably don't have anything of interest to you. And then bam, they, um, I, they open that rickety old <laughs> suitcase and dump it on the dining room table. And your heart just starts to raise and you start to think about all of the possibilities that are in front of you. But I'm wondering, this was something of an open secret in the sense that this wasn't done by subterfuge. There were public hearings, there were meetings. There were zoning commissions, there were committees, there were discussions, there were offers that were made. What happened when you started to reach out to the other side of this story, which was Christopher Newport University? Were any of the officials surprised by some of the things that you told them? That's also a very interesting question. I think one of the premise for our reporting was that the school wasn't surprised that this happened, right? Like you said, it was an open secret. Like They had put a historical marker up on one of the areas still that represents where someone lived in a community. So basically there was someone who lived in the community who wasn't necessarily from the community, but a black resident of the community who had been vocal about the 1960s, spoke out against the 1960s seizure, but then ultimately he ended up being on the board of visitors at the college. So he sort of became an employee. So people who they were truly impacted by this, it doesn't seem authentic to them, right? So the university response to our reporting, I don't know necessarily if they were surprised by what happened. I think many people, especially students, I, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of students at the college. They feel like they weren't aware of this entire history to begin with, and they wish they had been taught the full history of what happened to the community and actually the college's role in being either complicit or active in pretty much erasing the rest of the community. That part was what wasn't acknowledged publicly. And that's pretty much what our story uncovered. We didn't stop at 1960 like many of the historical markers had done, right? We continued to follow what happened to this community over time. And it really did show that the college played an active role in displacing many of the remaining residents. I also thought it was important that you found that some of the Johnson's descendants attended this school, that they took advantage of the educational opportunity that was literally, however unwelcome, in their backyard. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that was one of the things I discovered that just completely blew my mind, mainly because two of their children, two of their three children, both attended the college and paid to attend the college. Just imagine this, like, image, right? Like you are living in your parents' house, you're attending the college that pretty much displaced or seized some of your family's property, and you're paying to attend the college at the same time. So that was just a mind-blowing fact to me, mainly because in an ideal world, you would think that there would have been something in place for these families prior to our reporting, right? But there wasn't. So this showed there really was no real reconciliation that had occurred because of the fact that the child of a Johnson is attending a college, living in his parents' house while also having to pay to attend there. It also shows the humanity of the families who were impacted because the fact still remains he thought, hey, at least I can take advantage of the college being here. And there was no ill will or bad blood there for him because he did take advantage of the proximity. It's just unfortunate that that also meant the declining of his family's generational wealth at the same time, you know. You worked with two other journalists closely on this project, the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism's Louis Hansen and ProPublica's Gabriel Sandoval. Can you talk a little bit about what each of them contributed to this project? Yes. So I worked with Lewis Hansen and Gabriel Sandoval on this project. Our editor was also Daniel Golden from ProPublica. And so uh, we pretty much worked together to 
tell this story in a way that not only focused on the local aspect, it also brought it up to this as a United States issue and how many of the colleges that the few we named in our reporting, and there are many more, have yet to acknowledge their role in disrupting Black communities during the 1960s and also the aftermath of that today. And so um, as a team, we were able to discover Basically, in 1959, actually, there was a amendment to a federal housing policy. And what we discovered was that not only was this happening because of urban renewal at the time, but urban renewal was also giving colleges incentive to do this even more. Right. They were partnering with local government to expand these urban renewal development projects, and they got financial incentives from the federal government to do so. And so the discovery of that opened up this whole other can of worms for us to look at really how deeply this impacted communities across the country. And what we found was is that this was pretty much a standard, like this was a playbook essentially that colleges followed during that time. It wasn't a random occurrence here and there. It was really a playbook. And that was something that as a team we discovered. And I think it really did help us to really show people that um, this is an issue that of the past, which really does play out in current time for these families still today. This was an intense project with a lot of partners and a lot of help, including from ProPublica's Remarkable Graphics team. And the map that I encourage our listeners to go take a look at by Lucas Waldron, I thought really captured the drama of what happened to what was called Johnson Terrace this, in this Black neighborhood where the Johnson family lived as it began to shrink as the eminent domain took effect. Yes. And Lucas was pretty amazing in being able to put that together. We worked very closely on that. We used some of the maps that um, I had sourced from the city circuit court clerk's office. And Lucas did a really great job of sort of putting this map together using some of the um, archival imagery the map imagery that's currently online today. And what he did was essentially he showed the shrinkage, right, of the community versus the expansion of the college over time. And I think that is, like you said, pretty dynamic visually. It really does place the reader in the feet, in the shoes of the residents that experience this particular taking. We're talking with journalist Brandi Kellum about her Heckinger Grand Prize winning reporting with the team from the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism and ProPublica, which won the Heckinger Grand Prize at this year's EWA National Awards for Education Reporting. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcasting apps. And many thanks to everyone who has taken a moment to rate us on Apple Podcasts. Your support and feedback are helping us to grow. Sandy, this was in many ways a very personal project for you. Can you tell us the first time you set foot on the campus of Newport University? <laughs> yeah, so I'm from this area of Virginia. Uh, we call it the Tidewater region. And so I'm from a city that's probably about 30 minutes driving distance to Christopher Newport. And as a young teenage track and field athlete, I competed on Christopher Newport University's campus. As a matter of fact, it was during the same time period that many of the houses started to become demolished. It was probably around the same time James was taking his photos of the houses that they were being demolished, right? And so um, when I learned that, I was pretty shocked. I had no idea that it was a Black community that existed there, and there were still residents living there who were trying to save the community. And then as a Black student athlete, I'm pretty much running on the land of these former residents, seeking to achieve my dreams and aspirations while theirs are sort of being dashed by the expansion of the college, right? And so that really moved me to really look into this. I had been working on this. Uh, first of all, I was unaware of what happened until about 2021. And when I found out, I just had to dig deeper into it. And that's when I finally met some of the families. It really did hit home for me. And I knew this was going to be a beautiful story. And I'm so grateful for the partnership, as you mentioned earlier, of ProPublica and the Virginia Center for Investigative Journalism and also the co-publishers too. We co-published with the Chronicle of, of Higher Education and Essence magazine. So we made sure we reached a large audience with this. And I think that the impact that we're seeing today shows that we did reach the right people. Well, let's talk about that impact. What has been some of the impact of your story and what's next for the Johnsons? Right now, we have influenced legislation in Virginia, which actually became a law 
in May that, and it goes into effect next month, but it became a law by signage of the governor in May. And essentially, Virginia established a commission to look into how colleges across the state have done the same thing that Christopher Newport did to the families in the Shoe Lane community. So right now that commission will go on for about two years. They have funding in order to bring on a panel of people from residents, experts, or what have you. But the point is, is that this was something that had not been established before we did the reporting. You know, in addition to that, we've seen a lot of recognition and a lot of discussions about these stories across the country. It has opened up a lot of discussions about what colleges should be doing differently to acknowledge this issue. How deeply were you into historical records before this project? I'm wondering what you might have learned or added to your journalist toolbox that you can share with our listeners. A lot. (laughs) (laughs) Did you catch the archive bug? Do you have it now, Brandy? Because I know what that feels like. I do. I could go down rabbit holes on deed records now. Um, I I mean, before I I hadn't even read a deed before this. To be honest, I never read a deed before I started working on this story. So I had to learn a lot from scratch, but now I'm just addicted to it. And and I love just digging down these deep rabbit holes of archival records. It's actually pretty fun. It's incredibly fun and it can be incredibly (laughs) rewarding, even if it's frustrating. And I think that's, that's what journalists and historians have a lot in common, I think. But I'm wondering, how did getting into all of that paper trail and the documentation, how did that influence the way you interacted with the living people that you were reaching out to for these stories? It helped, actually, because having done my own research, I could, one, you have to remember these are older people that I'm talking to. A lot of the people who I spoke with are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, especially the 80-year-old descendants that experienced this, having records where I've already done my homework, it made it a lot easier for them to open up to me, right? Because they had a certain level of trust in the fact that I was going to do my due diligence, right? But also because it made it easier for them to recall details that may, they may not necessarily have stored in their brains at, the, at that moment in time, right? So those records, I think, really helped to enhance the interviews and also create this level of of like closeness and trust that was truly needed to interject. Like we needed to inject that into the reporting to really help people understand what happened to and process really what happened to this community and the loss that they really experienced. Let me be devil's advocate for you for a moment. What do you say to people who say, okay, how is this specifically an education story? Well, number one, it's an education story on the sheer fact alone that it educated a lot of people about what happened to this community, right? (laughs) Right. Fair enough. But but, uh, if we're talking about education in the traditional sense, it's about colleges and universities and their history. And I think that we look at these institutions as ones that are supposed to uphold certain levels or aspects of integrity. Um, They help us to learn about things that are happening from our past or happened in our past and how they translate to our present. I think this sort of holds those type of institutions to a certain level of accountability, right? Because if we're going to rely on them to help advance society, so to speak, we also need to be aware of their role in causing certain harms to people in society. So in that way, I think it's a very important education story for that regard. When you look back at your reporting, is there anything you wish you could go back and take another crack at or that you might have approached differently from another perspective, knowing something you know now? Hmm, That's an interesting question. I think that, honestly, I don't know if there's anything I would do differently because I think the reporter's experience is just as important in these type of stories. The discovery created this sort of hunger for me to want to learn more. And I think that that influenced the way that the reporting was done. And I think the way it was done, I don't know if there was any other way it could have been done to create the level of impact that we've been seeing. So I don't know if I would do anything differently. One thing I am grateful for is the fact that Above all else, these families had, like you said, we talked about open secret earlier, like this was an open secret, but for them, this was sort of like a traumatic experience that they were constantly being reminded of every time they saw this historical marker that really did not represent them, right? And so when we finally published the story, the college responded with this town hall. Some of the families actually showed up and it was the first time that they had ever been able to address the institution they felt like had caused the harm and say like, you haven't done us 
right. You haven't done us justice like we think you should. And I think for them, that was pretty much a healing moment for them, right, to be able to finally, like as an 80 year old, you make peace with that, right? So I think that ultimately that's something that um, I feel like created this sense of relief. And I think it also created a sense of source of healing for these families. And I think that, that you know, we don't have those opportunities a lot. And so to have that, it's pretty amazing to see. Can you tell us what you're working on next? Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, right now I am still following the impact of the reporting. So the commission, which becomes effective in July, we still have two years to watch to see what happens as a result of that. So as they continue to release reports or what have you, I definitely will be following that. In addition to just looking to further learn more about this community and other communities that this has happened to. So just continuing to listen to the feedback of the readers and families that have reached out and seeing if there's opportunities, further investigation of what happened to communities like the Shoe Lane community. Brenda, you got a chance to come to EWA's national seminar for the awards banquet. How'd you like your first EWA experience? Oh man, it was pretty amazing. I mean, what an amazing experience to it be my first EWA. Right. And I'm also uh, invited to speak. And then we win the grand prize for our reporting. So it was an amazing experience. Those acknowledgements were definitely the cherry on top. The greatest part of the experience in the seminar for me was just connecting with really great reporters, people who really are invested in great journalism and don't mind sharing their skill sets and learning lessons with each other. It's almost like an open dialogue. And I felt very much like I was in a community of journalists at the conference. So it was a great experience for me. I'm glad to hear that, Brandy. And we're very happy to welcome you to the EWA community. And we hope you stick around. I look forward to more conferences. Randy Callum is an Emmy Award-winning journalist who reports for ProPublica and the Virginia Center for Investigative Reporting. We encourage you to take a look both at the uprooted project as well as the accompanying documentary, which she directed. Randy, thank you for making time for EWA Radio. Thank you so much for having me. And that wraps up an episode for us. If there's a reporter or a story you want to learn more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For 77 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, take good care of yourselves, and thank you for listening. 